to take your Bible and look with me in Zechariah chapter 9. And my text is going to be from just verse 9, basically. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And I want to speak with you on this title of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is King of Zion. We're looking at the different titles of Christ going through alphabetically. And here we come now to the another K, if you will, King of Zion. And this is taken from this one verse here in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. It says here, Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, and here it is, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So here the command is given to rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion. Now when we come over to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22, we know that Zion, which here is described as that hill on which Jerusalem was built, and yet just like other types and pictures and prophecies of the Old Testament, Zion was a type of Christ's church. So when we read this, rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Rejoice greatly, O people of Christ, who are described as his daughters, because the church is the bride of Christ. And he, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22, the writer of the Hebrews says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. So very clearly there, it's not talking about an earthly Jerusalem, especially reading this prophecy in Zechariah 9. It's forward-looking to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to his true Jerusalem, to his true Zion, that elect people that was given him of the Father and to an innumerable company of angels, those angels that were kept from being fallen, as was Satan and his minions. And it says, to the general assembly and church, that word church means called out ones of the firstborn. Well, who's the firstborn? That's Christ. Firstborn, he has that title as the firstborn with all authority. He's the heir. And it says, which are written in heaven to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, justified men who have been made perfect. How have they been made perfect? Through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even back here in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, it speaks about Christ the King coming unto thee. It wasn't him waiting for his people to come to him, but he came to them, and he is just and having salvation. That one statement there tells you everything about why the Lord Jesus Christ had to come in the flesh. Some might say, why couldn't God just have decreed the salvation and it would have been done? No, it was necessary that he come and bring that salvation, that he earn and establish it in the flesh, that the justice and holiness of God be satisfied through this man, the mediator, and uh, therefore salvation accomplished. So we see here this prophecy in Zechariah giving great encouragement to those that are the Lord's people. We can read it today and even in this promise, this foregoing promise that we see here by the Spirit of God we see just how beautiful was God's purpose then in naming this one who should come. 
we know from reading the New Testament that this was the Lord Jesus Christ. And here he's called thy king. That means the sovereign. That's who he is. He came meek and lowly. It says riding upon an ass. Didn't come in on a white horse, big white stallion, and run through the land, no. But meek and lowly upon a colt, the foal of an ass. We'll look at that in just a little bit. But there are two places in the New Testament where this particular verse in Zechariah is cited, or I cited, in Matthew chapter 21. Look there with me. Matthew 21 and verse 5. Here we see how the new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 5, and this is speaking of Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. In verse 21, when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, verse 1, and were come to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man have say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. And all this was done. See that in verse 4? That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. And even though it doesn't name the prophet, now reading, we know that this was the prophet Zechariah saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. So this would have been a female donkey that had a colt, and rather than separate them, the Lord brought them both. And uh, the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and straight and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So here's where we see then this prophecy of Zechariah being described as fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, over in John chapter 12, there's the second reference that we find here in verse 15. Same situation, told from a different perspective, but nonetheless the same, where he was brought into Jerusalem. And it says, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. See, there it seems to indicate that he was riding on the young colt that had never been ridden on before. And the other, the mother was brought along as a guide to the young colt. But verse 15, fear not. It just puts a little bit of different perspective. Here it says rejoice greatly. Well, when you're rejoicing, there's no fear. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt the young foal. So there's no doubt then as to the application of this verse here. From comparing these three texts, we perceive then that the gospel writers, they weren't necessarily trying to stick precisely to the Old Testament text because they were quoting this from memory, if you will, they didn't each have a copy of uh, the text in their hand, but nonetheless, what they cited, and whether they cited it from the Hebrew, you have to understand also that this time, the Greek, the Old Testament scriptures had been translated into Greek, which is called the Septuagint, but either way, how they cited it. Here it says rejoice. The one said fear not. I believe that was the Spirit of God directing them even in how they 
wrote it. The clear message, however, was that, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. And uh, that's how we see the coming of Christ as the Messiah described in the New Testament. He's that one. The Old Testament said he's coming. The New Testament said he has come. And that he's coming again. But I find it interesting here also that he's described not only as the king of Zion or the king of Israel, but he's repeatedly called also the son of David because that was his lineage. He was to come through that the son of David. And so what it says is that from the beginning, God purposed that Christ should be the king. He should be the one to reign. Even in coming in the flesh, there's some that say, well, he came the first time to be the savior, but alas, they put him to death, so now he has to come back again to rule. No. Behold, thy king cometh. Rejoice, shout greatly. When he came the first time, he came as God's king. Pilate even questioned him, Art thou the king of Israel? And the Lord said unto him, Thou sayest. It came right out of your mouth. Even though they sought to crucify him, that did not in any way diminish who he was as the king. Their rebellion against him, they said, His blood be upon us and our children. And it is. It continues to be. You don't denounce the sovereignty of Christ as king and expect to get away with it. When people say today, well, I still think it's man's choice. Well, then you're flying in the face of Christ the King. Nowhere in Scripture does he ever abdicate his power to say, well, somehow it's up to you to believe. I came, I'm presenting, I'm offering myself, but now you've got to make the decision. Nowhere do you find that in Scripture. If you don't bow, you'll be crushed by this stone. But to him, the kingdom has always properly belonged. And all the way back in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, now we're going way back toward the beginning, where Jacob is pronouncing his blessing on his sons before he passes from this life. And he calls his sons unto him in Genesis 49, and we could read what he said to each one, but of particular interest for me, is what we read here in verse 9 and 10 of what Jacob pronounced to Judah. He said, Judah is what? A lion's whelp. Well, that's who Christ is called, the lion of Judah. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Even here we see, we talk about the lion being the king of the jungle. The lion does what he wants. And in that we see a type and picture of Christ. There's no man, if he stoops down to lie down, who's going to rouse him up until he's ready? In the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. But he came as sovereign, and verse 10 tells us, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. All the way back here in the beginning, it was purposed that that scepter be through Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until what? Shiloh come. Well, who's Shiloh? That's Christ. He's peace. And unto him, it says, shall the gathering of the people be. That's why back here in Zechariah 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Why did he come? To gather a specific people that the Father had given him. And he knows each one. He knows those that are his. He didn't come down here to try to save anybody, but to call out each one that the Father had given unto him. And here it says again in Zechariah 9 and verse 9, he is just and having salvation. That means salvation is in his hands. That's what he prayed in John 17. He thanked the Father. Let's look at it in John chapter 17. I don't want to just quote these. But this is not any new revelation. It's been 
from the beginning in John chapter 17 in verses 1 to 3 our Lord's praying this prayer to his father before going to the cross the cross was not a surprise to God even as the fall was not a surprise to God God purposed it that out of fallen humanity he might redeem a people unto himself these words verse 1 spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said father the hour is come you see all of this foreordained before time but comes down to this hour glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee and thou hast given him as thou hast given him power over all flesh that sounds like a king to me doesn't it? he rules over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many that would let him is that what your bible says nope that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal. That means salvation is in his hands, just like we're reading here. He's just in having salvation. He'll save no more than those that the Father's given. And this is life eternal, that they might, they might know thee. Not everybody, but they might know thee, the only true God, and what? Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. He says there in verse 9 of the same chapter, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. These people that are saying, well, we need to be praying for everybody in the world. Nope, not even Christ prayed for everybody in the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. That sounds like a king, doesn't it? Sounds like a savior. One who actually has come to save. And so those two are important. He's righteous. That's what the word just means. He had to come and earn and establish that righteousness that God might be just to justify. And as a result, having salvation. So complete was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that when he had finished the work, there remained nothing but righteousness for God to impute to the spiritual account of those for whom he died. It wasn't delayed. It wasn't done till, done later when they believed. No, it was done there at the cross. So he is that righteous branch. When it says he is just, he's that righteous branch. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 23, in verse 5, how do you, how do you know somebody that the Lord has taught? Well, here's their testimony right here in Jeremiah 23 5 it says behold the days come saith the Lord that I will raise unto David what a righteous branch and a king you can't separate the two even a king shall reign and prosper if it says he reigns that means he gets everything he asks why this notion that somehow Christ came and wanted to save some, but alas, he can't save them because they won't let him. That's not a king. What does it say here? Shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. He came to satisfy God the Father through his righteous life and shall execute that judgment. Sounds pretty certain to me. And in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. Who's Judah here? Well, that's the seed of Christ. And who's the Israel here? Israel, Christ is the Israel of God. And so that Israel shall be saved. It's not talking about natural Judah, natural Israel. There's some still hanging around thinking somehow God's going to, in the end, save every one of the Jews. Nope. Here it's speaking of his spiritual people. And notice, this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's the testimony of any that the Lord has taught. And that's why I was saying, you listen to who gets the glory when you talk to people and ask them. It's the Lord our righteousness. It's not him and his righteousness plus mine that I contribute. And so unlike the proud and destructive conquerors of the earth of 
earthly kings when they go forth to conquer and they ride in on a high horse, how do we see Christ coming here in verse 9? Lowly and riding upon an ass. He, though he, he was God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It says there in Philippians chapter 2, but condescended to take on him the form of what? A servant. He was God's servant. Look at that with me over in Philippians chapter 2. That's what this is talking about when it describes him riding. It says the word uses the word lowly and riding upon an ass. You think about an ass. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried to hop on a donkey, especially a wild one and it's never been ridden before. I tried it once when I was a kid and boy, I, I landed on my back. My breath was knocked out of me and that thing, the hoof came that close to kicking me in the head as it trotted off. Never did that again. But here we find him, the king, riding on a, an ass that had never been ridden before, and yet it was following him as the master. That shows his power even over the worst of, of sinners. And yet we find him to be the, the savior and the one who comes to save, lowly and riding upon an ass. I forget what scripture I told you to turn to now. But uh, that's the emphasis that we see here, that uh, this Messiah who was to come would be manifest in his loneliness. I remember now, Philippians chapter 2. That's what I wanted us to look at. Philippians chapter 2. I've got a good memory, but it's short. Philippians 2, 9 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. But that was the following what it says there in verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus what every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's not just Jesus but Jesus Christ the Lord. And so as they sang when he came in and threw branches down his way and shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the king. That's who he is, the king, the sovereign, who cometh in the name of the Lord. He didn't just come down here on a whim, but he came in the name of God the Father to accomplish that salvation. What a beautiful prophecy then that we find here in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And how glorious is the Savior even in his, his humility. But that's what he said, come unto me all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am what meek and lowly. That's what he did, he came and identified with the lowliest of sinners. But oh, how grateful we are that that's the case. He came to save that which was lost. Well, a lot more there, but pray the Lord will bless what we've heard.